Hello booktube and welcome back to uh, the Future History Project. Uh, I'm filming these back to back here, uh, but this is for week uh, 14 part 1b and it will be uh, scheduled shortly after part 1a. And it's specifically to deal with uh, the short story that thou art mindful of him. Uh, which is a quote from uh, Psalms uh, in the Bible. Uh, the character in the story mentions it's from the Bible uh, when, he mentions, when, when he quotes that line, but they don't say exactly from where. Uh, the genesis of this story, uh, as, it, as described in The Bicentennial Man, this is the, uh, the film cover. It's, it's uh, Bicentennial Man and other stories. And it was written sort of it, it, as the flow goes. It's uh, light verse uh, that thou art full, that thou art mindful of him, and then by Centennial Man are the sort of uh, the the stories. But I've I've throw threw in um, um, sorry I threw in uh, light uh, no sorry too bad. Uh, because it sort of fits around that that time within the timeline to a certain extent, uh, but even as I mentioned in the previous video, light verse doesn't quite work uh, for for the actual universe that uh, or one of the universes that uh, Isaac Asimov created. But the genesis of it was from 1973. Ed Furman, who uh, of fantasy and science fiction, and Barry Maltzberg. Uh, one uh, wanted to do a uh, an anthology of of themes, uh, sort of taken uh, from certain writers, taken to the sort of a conclusion in a sense. So they approached Asimov to to do uh, something on uh, robots, and he first balked, but then decided to do it, and then uh, and, and then that's where uh, and. Uh, that thou art mindful of him came from and again it's it's a dilemma it's a dilemma about the three laws of robotics which is permeated throughout most of Isaac Asimov's short uh, robot short stories and even even the novels as well to a certain extent to a greater or lesser degree uh, this one is I think very important uh, because it, it, it does, I think, uh, f you know, in the timeline that, that if we go from the robot short stories into the robot novels, the Empire and Foundation, uh, Empire novels sort of are a little squeaky. But, uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll get to that when we do. But this, I think, is a pretty firm timeline uh, to a certain extent. It explains a lot anyway. Um, and then I think there's a, there's a possible divergence at the end where he never really continued other than possibly one story. Um, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's set in the late, uh, 22nd century. The, the ghost of Susan, Susan Calvin is there because it's got to do with the U.S. robots and mechanical men. And, uh, Keith Harriman, who had been director of research at the, uh, at U.S. Robots and Mechanical Men, uh, it says for 12 years. Um, and the reason why I say it's, it's, uh, late 20 sec, uh, 22nd century is because it's noted, like, there, there's a holographic image of, of, uh, Susan Calvin, and it says it's just over a century since she died. Now, we know f for a fact from um, Isaac Asimov's I, Robot, she was born in 1982. She received her PhD in 2008. Let's forget about the Zucky uh, uh, Reichardt, Mickey Zucker Reichardt uh, trilogy. That doesn't exist. Uh, and and she died. I, I'm not sure where this this date is, but it's sort of it, it fits for Asimov's sort of thing of numbers uh you know 90 uh, she died at the age of 82 which would make it about 2064 so we're talking uh uh 2170 ish around that time so basically um u.s robots and mechanical men was also founded in 1982 
So at this time, it they've been going for what? Uh, 20, 21 to 18. Uh, uh, roughly 200 years, let's say. Uh, well, 1982, 2082, 21 18. So almost three, 300 years, I guess. So give or take 300 years. Now... And, and they've been building robots all this time, you know, primitive. And then we saw through the Susan Calvin's uh, things, but the, but uh, the stories of you know uh, new nuances and leaps forward in technology, and with the Powell and Donovan uh, stories as well, with the leaps of of you know uh, interstellar travel as well, uh, and that's all due to do with the positronic brain and robots could not have been done without them and without Susan Calvin sort of, you know, proper, uh, continuing them and um, Powell and Donovan whatever you think of those stories uh, you know, obviously there could have been some other characters in there, but this is what we've got so go with it that's why I say go with it now, we, we, we learned throughout all these stories that there's, you know, Isaac Asimov himself has talked about the Frankenstein complex, about how humans have, have taken, you know, that think that the robots are going to, you know, turn on man and destroy man. And that's within the stories, uh, that they're afraid of the robots, that they, they don't quite believe that the three laws of robotics actually work or can work and we do see you know flaws and problems throughout the stories where things can happen you know um, or accidental deaths to humans uh, you know or conflicts of what to do uh, in certain situations so robots had been banned from earth in this in this timeline in this universe Let's call it the Susan Calvin universe at this point. So in the Susan Calvin universe, uh, robots had more or less been banned from Earth and can only be uh, out in space or on uh, stations or the moon, Mercury, uh, you know, wherever else in, in, in the uh, solar system. Um, and, and we see this propagated later in, in, in the, um, in the um, in robot novels where on Aurora and other planets, robots are a little more, you know, accepted uh, with humans, but not on Earth still. Okay, and this is like, this is three, uh, you know, many thousand years or several thousand years, I think it's in the future. Uh, it's like 33 something, I think. Uh, so it's like several thousand years. So nothing had sort of changed with that timeline but anyway so so they haven't you know only for special purposes or special permits to move them from place to place robots are not allowed on earth but within the laboratories of u.s robots and mechanical men they can or occasionally they'll place them in certain in certain places like they did with the galley slave at a university but it's very tied to to uh you know that that university and looking at galleys for, for publication and also bound by three laws of robotics and that was a another story uh you know uh, exploring a conundrum that can can arise because of the three laws of robotics and what the uh, uh what the robot was doing so uh, this starts out, as I say, in late 20, 20, uh, uh, the 22nd uh, century. So let's say somewhere in the uh, uh, 21, um, 80s, 9, 80s. I don't think much later than that, uh, maybe a bit before. So approaching the third, third century of, um, of uh, U.S. robots and mechanical men. Now... They've been pushed and pushed. Uh, humans still don't want uh, uh, robots on the Earth. And they're soon finding out that they're going to have to clear them off of uh, the moon as well. So U.S. robots is, you know, in dire straits in a sense. Because they're being squeezed and squeezed and the robots are being pushed out. 
so there's no sort of place for them to to expand anymore uh, with with the robots the way they've been doing it uh, but this Harriman has an idea like he he wants to find out like you know he wants to get around and find out why or not why but you know create a solution to uh, to the humans not liking robots and fearing robots so he creates a robot a JG series George series so this is George 10 uh, and wants him to sort of come up with a solution uh, he gives them more judgment uh, rational thinking uh, than the other other robots had, had up to that time um, in order to make decisions like okay who is the human that's telling me to do X Y or Z I've got two humans here that are both conflicting and if I if I do one one uh, human may get uh, harmed and if I follow the other one more humans or another human may get harmed so how does the robot choose between those is is it like because the one is smarter like one could be a child that's that's being uh, uh, telling the robot this so how does the robot make a decision which to follow usually it, it turns out that there's a conflict and they shut down in, in many ways they can't actually make a proper decision for this or the question uh, you know uh, Harriman asked George uh, you know you've, you've got you could save one human who is a scientist or an artist and you've got five older people you know that, that are ready to die like they're, they're elderly they only have a few years left to live more or less so what do you choose well you choose the five because you're saving more humans but is that really helpful for the human race but again the robots can't so they haven't been trained or programmed to make those value judgments and and uh, the other thing is too because their interaction with humans for these three centuries have always been in in sort of controlled environments uh, in the laboratory in space doing specific things the robots have not had time to study and understand humans so the Harriman uh, has this idea to have George you know come out you know with a clean slate and study humans by uh, by you know videotapes uh, you know everything However, at the same time, there's a pressure because the government is going to shut down U.S. robots and mechanical men. And they give them two years to liquidate themselves, basically. So, Robertson, who is still the, uh, the you know, descendant, is still the only, uh, you know, the, the biggest shareholder in the company. He funnels what money he does have into Harriman's project here. So Harriman wants George to come up with an answer, to tell him the answer, then he can go to sort of the committees and, and that. Because if it comes from the robot himself, it won't it won't be accepted because it's a robot. So, you know, he, uh, George, you know, for about a year, absorbs all this material, but he says he needs to be outside. He needs to see things but it's like it's not loud but he does do it and he gets the sort of the chauffeur for Robertson and he's the Robertson uh, the chauffeur is sort of scared because it's a robot and it shouldn't be there and he thinks that oh if there's anything if the robot goes awry then he'll just leave quickly but how do you know it could already be awry? like you know there's this irrational fear that uh, Asimov is showing towards robots and robots you know have seen this but they have not had enough time to acclimatize themselves and work with everyday humans in, in many ways. Because it's either Susan Calvin, it's robots, uh, you know, U.S. robots and mechanical men, uh, um, for the most part, uh, you know, in this, in the Susan Calvin timeline, uh, that they have interaction with, or specialists, scientists. They're not your everyday Joe. And that's what Harriman was is trying to get uh, George to do. So uh, George says, okay, well, he needs a little bit of help. What help does he need? Well, there's still George 9, uh, which wasn't quite up to snuff to him. But he wants 
uh, George 9 to, to, to bounce ideas off of because uh, even the George 10 has spent time thinking about this constantly. He wants to pose questions to George 9 and get a fresh response, like a, a, a almost like knee-jerk response to this. So Harriman allows this and they come up with the thing of saying, well, okay, then... You know, humans are afraid of the three laws of robotics because, you know, the save a human and the judgment. Well, let's make it, let's simplify it. You know, get rid of the three laws of robotics, but just have, you know, um, simplified robots that don't have to deal with humans. So they come up with a thing of an ecological type robot where uh, the, the, the description is like a little bird robot with a positronic brain that will go out and eat insects like you know that are invasive insects and help the ecology and they can they can create all sorts of these kind of robot worms and stuff like this to do specific things but you know it's to help the ecology and not like instead of using pesticides which causes other things or hormones you know like you know like it's every everything that the, the humans had tried to try to combat invasive things or to, to keep the ecology going always has side effects but the robots won't because they'll be very extremely extremely specialized in the thought in, in, in their in their tasks so he presents this with a sort of a little bird that, that catches fruit flies and it's more or less accepted it's more or less accepted uh, and then that will keep you uh, US robots and mechanical men going you know financially and as a business and Harriman and I guess uh, Robertson think that you know if, if after a time um, you know this this is accepted you know the positronic brains maybe slowly you can bring back you know humiform uh, robots you know, in, in time because because people will get used to the positronic brain having these these specialized robots around and they'll learn more slowly generation after generation so the you know the production of human-like robots have stopped the only ones that are left is George 10 and George 9 apparently uh, they're sort of mothballed uh, but they you know occasionally have enough energy to to discuss with each other and they do finally discuss uh, things and um, you know they they realize okay they got to define okay what is human like how do you how do you um, define a human that's a better human than somebody else and to, to follow so George 10 asks George 9 who do you think is sort of you know the better human to follow and George 9 says well you George 10 but he says well I'm not a human but you are under the three laws of robotics you are human. If, if you get rid of the, the, the uh, you know, physical attributes of what a human is, uh, the flesh and blood, the type of things, that actually George 10 is human. So, uh, and they sort of accept this and realize that, that yeah, uh, robots are going to be a more uh, advanced species of human humans and then so they it, it all concludes with you know three laws of humanics you know, humans you know rather than robotics uh, and and I find that kind of interesting because there there was another story uh, I think was it in this one I'm trying to remember now um, I'm not sure if it was robot visions is that the one where they where it travels in time uh, no I don't think so but there, there, there's the one that um, that is the that, that was the pre uh, one to read before the six, uh, and I missed it off the uh, uh, off the list. I, uh, sorry, I uh, I can't remember the title at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if it is the uh, Robot Visions. Um, no, it, it's. Um, Oh, it is. Yeah, Robot Visions. Okay. Uh, where um, the narrator is a robot and he goes into the future. And he finds out that, you know, the future is run by robots. Which I find kind of interesting. Uh, they, 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 the, the timeline isn't that far ahead, so it doesn't quite work in 
with this story. Uh, uh, thou art mindful of him. But it's that kind of thing where that's a possibility, an offshoot of this, but not in the order that, you know, it was written, but that's a potential offshoot of this. But I, I really liked uh, this story because it, it, it gets into a little more, you know, explaining. It, it, it's like he, he, he has retrofitted the other stories by this. Like, yeah, the ending about that, you know, robots are going to be a better human and they're going to eventually take over, uh, you know, and, and, and that. That is a little sort of Frankenstein complex type type thing. Uh, but up until that point, it sort of solidifies in my mind the other stories of what is really, really part of the Susan, what I call the Susan Calvin timeline, the Susan Calvin universe. And it makes perfect sense. And but it's done in hindsight. Like it would have been nice, interesting if if this was one of his earlier stories, and then he worked all his stories from that. But, you know, he's, he's a writer. He comes up with an idea, you know, and sometimes it's difficult to, to, to shoehorn an idea into, you know, it, it, he's, he's confined. So, but, uh, you know, generally, like, you know, he even said, you know, you, you read the order of the stories that are in The Complete Robot. But they do conflict, as we find out. Light verse conflicts and other ones conflict. You know, um, the robot visions ones conflict. You know, um, you know any ones like uh, the AL seven. What's it called? AL uh, robot AL seventy six goes astray. Works perfectly fine. You know, a boy's best friend can work okay because it's you know it's it's a robot dog and it's the beginning and Sally. You know. Um, but, you know, some of these other ones, like Victory Unintentional, doesn't quite work because there's aliens, there's Jovians. You know, Stranger in Paradise doesn't quite work because it's a different future. Uh, you know, Let's Get Together doesn't work because the Cold War is going. You know, um, there's quite a few of these. And, you know, the Tricentenary Incident, as well as... Um, well, well, basically all the Powell and Donovan and the Susan Calvin's work, uh, and even, uh, but then, yeah, Thou Art Mindful of Men, of, of him, I mean, works to a certain extent, as I say, and then the Bicentennial Man, well, that's next week, uh, that's week, uh, 15. So, uh, it's a little, it's, it, yeah, it, 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 I really, really enjoy this story, that's, that's just sort of say that, and I think it's an important story that sort of, retrofits and solidifies those stories and works towards uh, the, you know, the, the, the robot novels, uh, The Caves of Steel and uh, The Naked Sun and The Robots of Dawn, The Robots and Empire, and then The Foundation. You know, Asimov likes, uh, you know, things, that's why I say, like, you know, Susan Kelvin was born in 1982. She died at the age of 82. That worked. And just to even look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the Foundation trilogy, you know, he, he did his Isaac Asimov, obviously, is the author. But then they do the second uh, Foundation trilogy, which was commissioned after he died. Uh, but the thing is, it fits in with this thing. If he, if he did choose it, it's, it, all the authors are B. You know, if there was a third trilogy, it would be authors that began, uh, surnames began with C, you know, and so on. And that's... That's kind of, uh, you know, his working of this stuff. Uh, but this is definitely in retrospect. He's retrofitting, but it works. It makes sense, and it and it changes. Um, it, well, it, it's not changes. It solidifies, I think, what these stories are and how and the importance to this because, you know, they are simplified, simple stories, but this one expands it and the reasons for this. The ending, yeah, uh, you know, he could have, he could have left it a little more open rather than, you know, uh, George Ten thinking that, you know, uh, that humans are, you know, are, are second class to the new human, uh, the humans which are robots. Um, that's maybe a little heavy-handed. I, I, I agree with that.
But anyway, um, the part two, we will be reading two stories. Uh, they're longer stories from Foundation Friends, uh, and that'll be tomorrow. Uh, we're doing Strip Runner by Pamela. I think the order is actually uh, Car Hunters of the Concrete Prairie by Robert Sheckley and Strip Runner by Pamela Sargent, uh, for whatever reason. Um, I don't remember those. I think I've read them, but I don't remember them. They're a bit longer, uh, but I'll try to do those in one video. Uh, if, if they're significant a month uh, enough, I will, I will separate videos again like this one. And again, I hope everybody's enjoying this. Uh, and um, uh, there'll be a lot more discussion, I think, for Bicentennial Man. Uh, that'll be uh, week, week 15. Uh, even the novel, the, the, the Robert Silverberg novelization of it, uh, but mostly the novel at or novella, uh, the Bicentennial Man, is is important. Not quite within the Susan Calvin universe, but we'll leave it at that, and we'll we'll discuss that at that time. Take care, book two. I'll see you next time.